Hi friends. All right, down to the final five chapters. I'm gonna read chapter 60 and 58 and 59 today. Um, share my screen. Chapter 58. Thursday, May 14th to Sunday, May 17th, 1778. And this is, ooh, um, Adion, not going to try that. Deacon Thomas responding to Washington's request for Oneida warriors. I hope I'm pronouncing that as well. We don't know what will happen, but we are determined to lay our bones in the American cause. Two days after we poured the key, a group of Monita warriors arrived at camp. They are at the request of General Washington. They brought with them bushels of corn, for they had heard how hungry our soldiers were. And on, um, I wonder if it's Juanita. An Oneida woman came to, name of Polly Cooper, to show how to make a good soup from the corn in the manner of her people. His Excellency and General Knox were grateful for the corn, but they were most excited by the weapons. The warriors had brought their bows and arrows in addition to their muskets. In the time it took to load and shoot a musket once, a warrior could shoot four arrows or more. When I heard this discussed in the dining hall, I thought to myself that it would be smarter to teach the entire army in the ways of bows and arrow, bow and arrows. General Green left for the fish kill, fish kill fort that, that same day. Bellingham had tried his best to convince the general he should accompany him, but he was foiled to my relief. If he'd gone, he would have taken me and left Isabel behind to serve the ladies. Any separation now would be disastrous. In her husband's absence, Mrs. Green arranged for a supper to keep her amused. Lady Washington loaned her Hannah, his excellency's cook, for the occasion which freed Isabel to put on her good blue sh short gown and clean skirt and serve the table with me. All of the windows in the dining room were open as the May evening air was warm. Instead of smelling of sour soldiers and wood smoke, the room was filled with odors of roasted beef, pickled beets, baked onions, the rose water worn by Mrs. Green, and the freshly powdered wigs of the gentlemen. Mrs. Green had requested extra candles to light the table and fresh flowers in a bowl at the center of it. Despite the setting, Bellingham's mood was foul. Whilst the others laughed and conversated, he mostly drank wine and scowled. His nature was keenly sensitive to slights, and he took being left behind by General Green as a bad omen. I avoided his gaze. We served the meal, which was much grander than anything ever prepared by Mrs. Cook. The ladies tried to steer the talk away from the war, but the gentlemen, most of them wearing officers' uniforms, always brought it back. New recruits, recruits were pouring into camp and needed time to learn the fighting drills of Baron von Steuben, which provoked a series of funny stories about the Baron's teaching techniques. A young fellow who was an aide to General Washington waved Isabel to the table to serve him more biscuits. He took two from the plate she held. Did your girl bake these, he asked Bellingham. I should say not, answered Bellingham. Isabel can't cook to save her life. Mrs. Green wrapped the back of Bellingham's hand with her folded fan. Do not disparage the talents of young Isabel. Her understanding of her needle is far superior to any I've met. Isabel backed up, set the platter of biscuits on the sideboard, and stood with her hands folded in front of her, her face empty. Knowing how much you appreciate her skill, said Bellingham, makes it more the pity that she will not join your household. Mrs. Shippen laid down her, folk, her fork. You're not buying her, Catherine? Sadly, no, Mrs. Green sighed dramatically. Nathaniel says it would be imprudent with the war still on. Well then, Mrs. Shippen said, I have a friend in Virginia who could use a seamstress. Bellingham nodded. Your concern is touching, madame, he said as I removed his plate of bones and gristle. But I've already concluded the matter. Colonel Gilpin of Maryland has purchased Isabel as a wedding gift for his new bride. Mrs. Green pouted. Please tell me she won't be leaving until I do. Isabel placed a dish of gooseberry tart in front of Bellingham. I am afraid she must, Bellingham said. The colonel has arranged to send a wagon of his belongings home this week. Isabel should be, shall be going with it. There was knocking on the front door, but I was too stunned by Bellingham's words to respond. Isabel did a better job at concealing her thoughts than I did. She collected the dirty plates from the other gentlemen. After she stacked them on the tray by the door to the kitchen with her back to the table, she quickly wiped her eyes on the loose neckcloth. She sniffed once and took a sharp breath before turning around 
her features again a mask of indifference. There was a second knock at the door. Attend that, Bellingham ordered. Bonsoir, the Marquis de Lafayette said as I opened the door. Though only 20 years of age, the Marquis was said to be one of the richest men in France. He'd volunteered to help the American cause and had become a favorite of General Washington's as well as Mrs. Green's, for he was handsome, charming, and a wee bit devilish, which made her made for good gossip, as all the ladies in camp were fond of him. Good evening, sir, I said. It is indeed. He handed me his hat and gloves and hurried past me into the dining room, where he was greeted with cheers from the assembled company. I set his hat on the shelf by the door and laid his gloves flat next to it, then followed him, taking up the wine bottle from the side table as I passed it. Isabel had disappeared into the kitchen with, his, with the tray of dishes to be washed. I poured the Marquis a glass of wine, which he lifted up. Mon Dieu, you must hear my news, he said. His Excellency has appointed me to lead a battalion and hunt the British. Bellingham lifted his glass. Huzzah, may you thrash them soundly. The entire company toasted the sentiment and I was kept busy refilling their glasses. Which companies are you leading? Asked the fellow who so loved the biscuits. All of Poor's Brigade, McLean's men, and the Onidas. Some 2,000 fellows in all. He could not help but grin. I can tell you I'm most honored by His Excellency's faith in me. Mrs. Green said something quickly in French that made the Marquis blush. No, Madame, he answered. It is not the same as leading the entire army. That is the privilege of General Washington alone. My forces tomorrow will provide only a prelude of what's to come. Tomorrow, Mrs. Green fluttered her fan. We, oui, he sipped, sipped his wine. That is why I come so late to your lovely dinner and why I must leave so soon. I took my place by the door, hoping that no one could see that I was shaking. Tomorrow is our last chance to run, our only chance. Chapter 59, Sunday, May 17th to Monday, May 18th, 1778. This is some Joseph Addison, Cato, Act 1, Scene 3, performed at Valley Forge. Oh, think what anxious moments pass between the birth of clots and their last fatal periods. Oh, tis a dreadful interval of time, filled up with horror all and big with death. The Marquis de Lafayette left early along with the officers' wives, but more fellows arrived to continue the party long, long after Mrs. Green had retired. Hannah's husband, Isaac, came from headquarters with a wagon to take her home. She was a kind soul and had prepared much more food than required for the dinner party when she realized how Isabel had been struggling in the kitchen. I moved back and forth between kitchen and dining room, helping Isabel with the washing up and tending to the needs of the gentlemen deep in conversation about the best way to unseat the British from Philadelphia. Just when I was on the brink of screaming at them, a contagion of yawning passed from one fellow to the next. The visitors had asked me to bring their horses around to the front door. Once they departed and the gentleman of Moore Hall had gone up the stairs, I finally had a chance to speak with Isabel and plan our escape. But I did not even get the first word out of my mouth before Bellingham walked in. I jumped to my feet. Sir, is something the matter? Do you require me? He yawned. Not me and you, not you, Mrs. Green, is restless in her sleep and says she feels ill. I think she just misses her husband. She would like Isabel to sit with her. Now, Isabel asked. For the night, Bellingham added, you may move your palate to her chamber. Make her up a pot of tea with whatever herbs one uses for calming. Yes, sir, Isabel swung the kettle over the fire. Thank you, sir, I said, though there was nothing to thank him for. He gave an absent nod but did not leave, preferring to watch Isabel take down a clean teapot from the shelf and walk to the larder for the tea. Fetch her pallet, will you? I did not want to leave her alone in a room with him, but I had little choice. I ran up the two flights of stairs, not worrying about the sounds of my heavy footsteps disturbing the sleep of anyone. If he had ill intent in mind, I might prevent it by causing a ruckus. I grabbed her pallet and blankets and thudded back down the stairs. Isabel must have been working as fast as me, for as I came down the attic steps, she and Bellingham were coming down the hall. I took it upon myself to knock loudly on Mrs. Green's door. Isabel is here, ma'am. I followed Isabel into the chamber, laid out the pallet as slow as I could, then bowed and departed. Bellingham had gone into his chamber by then, to my relief. I waited a bit in the dark kitchen, hoping that Isabel would be able to sneak out and we could escape in the night. We could make our way to um, close to camp and hide in the woods near the bridge, then work our way into the crowd that was sure to gather to see off Lafayette's troops. When, did she, when she did not creep down the stairs, I realized I had to prepare for the both of us. My first task was to examine the key we'd cast. I took a candle out to my sleeping shed and uncovered the pail from its hiding place behind the woodpile. 
After removing the brick and the top layer of sand, I held the lead piece in the light. For that was all it was, a thin puddle of lead with sand stuck to it. In no way did it resemble a key. Okay, things are not looking very good for them and that smooth plan of exiting with the armies in a few week, army with a few, in a few weeks um, did not go as planned. I think I knew that. Um, all right, we'll discuss these two chapters tomorrow. Um, thanks, do your jots.